Well, good morning. Let me see. Do you hear me well? Okay, let's try again. Good morning. Well, good morning, Spring Valley, and welcome to our worship this morning. My name is Rosdani Ortiz, your associate pastor here at our beloved church, Spring Valley, and it is a joy to be with all of you this morning. And I don't know about you, but I'm always excited about Sundays. I'm always excited to come and see you all this morning to be with my church family and experience so much love. Are you also excited to come on Sundays? Of course you are, because that's why you are here, amen? amen? And who does not like to be in a place like this? It is amazing where, uh, where we come together to a place like this where we can sing praises to our God, led by our amazing choir, where we come to a time of prayer together. We have the opportunity to hear the many ways we can engage in the life of the church. And also, I'm excited because today we begin our new worship series, Greater Than, which is a special series because it's part of our stewardship campaign. So you will also be hearing a little bit about that as well. And as a community of faith, we will lo love to know that you're worshiping with us this morning. So I want to remind you, the, those who are worshiping with us here in person, to fill out your attendance card that it's on the bulletin here on your hands and leave that at the offering plate. And all of those who are watching us online through our Facebook page, we will love to know that you're also with us, joining us online. So leave a comment. And let us know that you're here with us. And if you're here for the very first time, we want to welcome you all and extend a very warm, warm and a special welcome. And we're so glad that you're here as our very special guest. And now I would like to invite Cynthia Lee to open us in our call to worship this morning. Would you please stand for our call to worship? Friends, we serve a God who designed us for community. Come, let us worship together. We serve a God who doesn't ask us to go alone. Come, let us sing together. We're loved by a God who chooses to be with us. Come, let us walk together. Let's join in the unison prayer. God, we gather as a people who want community more than company and who would rather be known by each other than to look like we have our lives together. Lead us as we grow closer together by worshiping you. Teach us that life together is better than isolation. It is in your name that we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Bridget Pinot. I am our McKinsker Fellows that sings in the choir. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, Come Christians, Joy to Sing. Join to sing number 158. <laughs>
Good morning. Uh, I'm Cynthia Lee. I'm ch a chair this year of your staff parish relations committee. But today I'm going to talk about a stewardship moment or uh, bless this neighborhood, if you will. When I first met Pastor Frank after he'd been appointed here, but before he had arrived here, we had a little awkward cup of coffee trying to find something to talk about, chatting back and forth. He's asking me what this church is all about. I've been here 40 years. You know, what's our mission? What, what gets us excited? What do we need? And he asked me, what do you think about a theme of bless this neighborhood? I so hope my face did not show what my brain was thinking, which that's boring. <laughs> We've been a missional church forever. We've done so many things, network, Dobie, Guatemala, Austin, you name it. We've just been doing all of these missions for the whole time I've been here. So what's new and exciting about that? But he kept talking about it. He did the cards for us to hand out. He led some of you on a walk through the neighborhood to meet some of the merchants. It was not resonating with me. I just wasn't getting it. So I kept praying about it, saying, God, you know, what's in this for me? I don't, I don't quite understand. I do these missions, but I don't get this bless this neighborhood. But I kept praying about it as he kept talking about it. And it finally hit me. It was almost like a slap in the forehead. Spring Valley Elementary, the closest school to our church. I could connect there because that was familiar to me. I used to live across the street from that church when I moved here 40 years ago. My oldest son went to the elementary there. My toddler played on the playground. We were all over that school. They had grown up and moved away, and I moved to a different neighborhood. I keep coming back to the church, but I was not connected at that school. I thought, I think I'll go and explore what they might need and how we might connect. And I met the assistant principal. She was so gracious and happy to see me, happy that our church knew they were there and might have some interest in helping them. Their needs are great. Over 300 students, 80% of them are financially challenged families. And so uh, she gave me a laundry list of things we could do. It was overwhelming. But I prayed over that list and I said, God, help me think of one thing that we can do and sustain as a start. And it's led to, to decide to focus on the teachers. There are 60 teachers there, and they're loving those children, teaching those children every day. So we came up with the idea, and as I talked about it, some of you emerged that were also shared my interest or are willing to jump in. We decided to do one gratitude appreciation to the teachers monthly. So last, last week we started, some of you helped me assemble these, a little packet with a Halloween gadget, uh, a meditation for teachers, and a flyer inviting all 60 teachers and all 300 plus of their students to come to our trunk or treat uh, on the 29th of October. Next month, we're doing a box lunch for the teachers and the administrators on one of their service days. And we'll be there wearing our Spring Valley t-shirts, serving them and meeting all of that day. So I know so many of you have already found your personal missions and where you can connect personally. But what convicted me is that like, even with all the years that my husband and I have led the Dobie toy drive, I had made one single personal connection at Dobie. I talked to them when it was time to deliver the toys. We depended on your generosity to collect hundreds of toys, took them there, handed them off, Merry Christmas. Whoops. <laughs> I'm excited about this. Merry Christmas and away we went. Not one personal connection. So how can I share the love of Christ with people I don't know? So that is the point of my wanting to find my connection of bless this neighborhood. I encourage all of you to seek the same thing. If it's Spring Valley, please let me know. But pray about it. Think about it. And I assure you, not only will our church be blessed and the neighborhood be blessed, but you too will be very blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, for all that wonderful invitation. And I hope that as you hear her, her, her you feel inspired about where God is leading you to serve in our community. Like she said, there's a great need in just one school. Imagine if we go around our community finding out what other needs they have. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about our upcoming events and we have plenty for all of you to engage in our life of the church 
First of all, we want to invite you to our United Women in Faith, their craft show and bake sale today. And they share with me that all the sales goes to their missions and they support a Spring Valley Children's and Youth, the Music Department, Parkland, and Parkland Hospital. So it's kind of like give back and doesn't ask kind of type of thing. So I hope that you guys after worship can stop by in the Wesley Hall and buy some goodies and you know, bless the neighborhood in this way. Also, last week, we started our new Sunday schedule, and there's something new that is happening in our church, and that's small groups. So we want to invite you a couple small, small groups that are happening after worship. One of them is greater than small group, that if you notice, we're on the worship series, greater than. So Pastor Frank here, We'll kind of like de dive deeper into this worship series at his office at 1115, right? And just talk a little bit more um, and dive deeper into our scripture. Then we have also a covenant discipleship group. That is a group of no more than seven people who will gather weekly to hold themselves mutually accountable for their discipleship journey. And this is something that John Wesley emphasized a lot in the beginning of the Methodism. So I hope that if you are interested, you can contact Pat Chrisley. Pat, where, is, where are you? Look, in the parlor. And you can contact her after worship. She will be in the lobby. So if you're interested, right, just stop by and she will guide you to their covenant discipleship group. And then the other one is coffee and Jesus. There's plenty of coffee and plenty of Jesus. And this is with me. So it's very fun. And we will meet at 11.15 at the new, new room name it's called the table so there will be fellowship praying and open conversation about our new study and the name is called hearing and responding to god's voice by a united methodist pastor here in our north texas conference susan rob so i hope that you can join me after worship too and let us grow in our faith together amen so as we continue to worship our Lord, it is the time to come together in prayer, a time to feel pr the presence of God among us, to experience the Holy Spirit, to ask God for our struggles, our joys, because we know that God truly listens. We know that God cares and loves us. Amen? So let us begin with some seconds of silence as we lift up our own prayers, and then we will continue to pray together. So let us pray. God, we come together before you, God, knowing you love us in ways that we may not comprehend. No matter how many times we doubt you of your power and might, about your love and grace, you show us again and again that we are your children and that you are our God. It is amazing how you continue to use us to share your grace and love with those we encounter daily. As a church, we are grateful for giving us the call to connect more with our community. The ways we're connecting with the Spring Valley Elementary School, with the small businesses around our community, with pairing food for the Austin Street Shelter, and with our Halloween Music Fest. God, may you use these moments where we are connecting with our neighbors to be one of the many blessings that you will pour into their lives so they can meet you, God, 
and know how much you care and love them. We're grateful for the many opportunities we have here in our church to continue to grow in our faith. It is incredible how we can grow deeper in our connection with you and with one another when we come together to study your word, to pray, and build lasting friendships. Bless the new small groups that have been formed and the ones that continue. May these spaces continue to be a place of transformation where each person continues to thrive, God, to become imitators of your son, Jesus Christ. And God, we come also before you to give us peace and comfort. As we continue to mourn the passing of many beloved members of our church in the last few weeks. We especially pray this week for the life of Roth Delt Wheeler. We pray that his family can find strength and comfort in you, God, during this difficult time. And God, because of our faith in you, we came together this morning to share our requests with you, and, but also to pray for the world. And at this moment, we lift in prayer the conflict between Israel and Palestine. There have been already many casualties and so many wounded. Please, God, bring an end to this war. We pray for protection of the families but especially over the children. And lastly, God, listen to each of our hearts here in this place. We thank you for your presence among us, for listening and for responding in the many ways that you manifest. We lift all our prayers knowing, God, that you love us. And we conclude as the body of Christ Praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to remain seated as we sing our hymn of preparation from The Faith We Sing, number 2223. They'll know we are Christians by our love.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Uh, My name is Pastor Frank, and uh, what a great day it is to come together for worship. I'm so glad to see everybody uh, as we begin this new sermon series, Greater Than, uh, thinking about financial stewardship and how we use the resources that we've received from God in order to bless the neighborhood, the congregation, and the world in the name of Christ. Uh, Our scripture this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 17 through 15. It's up there on the screen. You can read with me in a Bible you brought with you or on your phone, or if you like to just kind of listen, this is the Apostle Paul encouraging the, the Corinthians to share generously with an offering he's collecting. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning with verse 7, listen for the word of God. Everyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. Y'all heard that, that sentence before? God loves a cheerful giver? Yeah. Let's hold on to that one. Uh, God has the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of grace. That way you will have everything you need always and in everything to provide more than enough for every kind of good work. As it is written, God scattered everywhere. God gave to the needy. God's righteousness remains forever. The one who supplies seed for planting and bread for eating will supply and multiply your seed and increase your crop, which is righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every way. Such generosity produces thanksgiving to God through us. Your ministry of this service to God's people isn't only fully meeting their needs, but it is also multiplying in many expressions of thanksgiving to God. They will get, this is the recipients of the collection, they will give honor to God for your obedience to your confession to Christ's gospel. They will do this because this service provides evidence of your obedience and because of your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone. They will also pray for you and they will care deeply for you because of the outstanding grace that God has given to you. Thank God for this gift that words can't describe. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, for the the amazing weather outside. We should have worship outside right now at this moment, uh, but we give you thanks because we know it's beautiful out there. And yet we've gathered in this beautiful space to be filled with your love and your presence. And so we pause for a moment to center ourselves. That we may feel the movement of your Holy Spirit on us. Your spirit that shapes us and guides us. Your spirit that molds us into the people that you would have us to be. Lord, change us. That we may be better servants of Christ that we may be better ambassadors for you. And that when people see us, they see your love that is embedded in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that as I speak this morning, your word may be heard through me, if not because of me, then in spite of me. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So, Who's excited to hear about giving for four weeks? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So I sent out a survey the other day to the congregation. And I'm just like, this is an anonymous survey. It's just for fun. Y'all know how many responses I got from the survey? But before I tell you, let me tell you that I sent out another survey a few weeks ago about worship. And we had 72 people respond to that one. You want to guess how many responded to the one about giving? 16. Yeah, the congregation is 80% less interested in financial support than worship. Okay, 
We're going to build that and make that happen. Okay. Yeah. So 16 people, including me, I'm one of the 16, uh, respond to this survey. It's still online. If you want to take it later on the day, you can do that. They're just kind of general questions about how we think about money. They weren't meant to be right or wrong answers, but there were four different categories, and the way you responded tells you how you feel about money. It gives you freedom, it gives you power, it's an expression of love, and there was something else that I thought. Anyway, uh, so what the, one question was, money is important to me because it allows me to do what I want to do, feel secure, get ahead of life, and buy things for others. 62% said it's important to make me feel secure. And 30% said to do what I want to do. Another question was, I feel that money frees up my time, solves my problems, is a means to an end, or helps make my relationships smoother. I'd like to break that down with the people who chose that one. What does that mean? Because it seems like money makes my relationships more difficult. But anyway, uh, 75% said they like money is a means to an end. 18% frees up time. Uh, nobody said anything about solving their problems with money, which is probably good. Uh, when it comes to saving money, I, 87% of us, have a plan and stick to it. Hey, that's good. And 12%. Ha, don't have a plan, but still find a way to save money. Awesome. This was interesting. If someone asks about my personal finances, I feel defensive, realize I need more education and for information. Nobody chose that one. I feel confident and competent, or I would rather talk about something else. 56% said they felt comfortable and competent. 31% would rather talk about something else. And 12% felt defensive when someone asks about giving, about personal finances. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. If I, uh, hold on, not, not that one. Uh, if I suddenly came into a lot of money, I wouldn't have to work. I chose that one. Uh, just being honest. Uh, wouldn't have to worry about the future could really build up my business or would spend a lot of time, a lot on family and friends and enjoy time with them more? What do you think? 62% said if they came into a lot of money, they would spend a lot, of, a lot on family and friends and enjoy time with them more. 25% said they wouldn't have to worry about the future. I wanted to ask this question, these questions, because, as indicated by the number of people who took the survey, in general, we're, we're uncomfortable talking about money, right? We live in this really strange cultural reality in our society. The society is driven by a consumer mindset, right? Buy more, spend more. Uh, the more we spend, the more we buy is a direct relation to happiness, right? There's a whole industry built on that falsehood. But we all participate in one way or the other. So the culture out there says money's good because it buys good things. It makes us feel important. It makes us feel valued. It, it raises our stature in the, in, in the eyes of others. But the other side is that we don't talk about it. It's a personal issue. It's between the individual and themselves, or maybe with their spouse or with their family, right? One of the questions was, uh, when it comes to personal finances in the family, I do it all myself. I pay all the bills myself. My spouse does it all herself, his self, pays all the bills. We share in that. Or another option was, we have our own separate accounts, and we do our own things separately. Let me say that uh, for this series, we are going to talk that money is not an individual issue. Money is a collective issue. 
The, the theme for today is we is greater than me. And as I thought about that idea that we is greater than me, I couldn't think of a better example in the scripture than Paul trying to uh, bring up this offering for the poor believers in Jerusalem. So Paul, uh, if, you, if you remember the story, uh, was not one of the original disciples of Jesus, right? Paul was a Pharisee originally, was converted, and then Paul's mission, as he understood it, was to the Gentiles, not to the Jews. So whereas the apostles... Uh, James, John, Andrew, Peter, those guys, they were focused on Jerusalem and on Israel. Paul's mission was the broader world, right? So Paul went to Greece, Paul went to Turkey, Paul traveled all over uh, Europe planting churches and even into Asia. But Paul always had a vision for his ministry that he wanted to take up a special offering for the poor in Jerusalem. And so Paul would go traveling to these churches that he plants in places like Corinth and Ephesus, uh, and he would tell them, you know, I've got this vision for this offering. And, and, and we should do that because the Jerusalem church birthed us. We would not exist without the home church, right? And we should support them because they have a great need. They have many poor people amongst them that are on hard times. We over here in Corinth, Corinth was a major city in the Roman Empire, a port city, a, a place of great wealth. Uh, the church that Paul planted in Corinth had a lot of high-powered people in the society, wealthy people, generous people, so Paul went to the Corinthians and said, hey, y'all are, you're the, ulti, you're the best example of the kind of people I need to support this mission to Jerusalem. You've got money. They need money. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We can support them. You know what the Corinthians said? We have our own problems. We have our own community that needs help. We, we've got people, the poor people in our own church that need our help. We don't know anybody in Jerusalem. They, they're on the other side of the planet from us. They might as well be. So Paul kept in contact with the Corinthians. He didn't give up on the vision, right? But he went to other places and started planting the same seeds. Now I, feel, I feel called to have this collection in Jerusalem. Let's support the Jerusalem church. They birthed us. We would not exist without them. We owe it to them. Let's do this. And what happened was, over time, as Paul went to other churches communicating this vision, the other churches, the smaller ones, the poorer ones, they started responding. They started turning in their pledge cards. And so now Paul is circling back to the Corinthians. Hey, y'all, remember last time I was around? I was talking about this Jerusalem offer, uh, offering, and y'all were lukewarm to it? guess what happened? I went and told everybody else how generous y'all are and how you're going to be on board with this because that's, that's the kind of people you are. And they, they were so inspired by your generosity that they got on board. This is how chapter 8, I read from chapter 9 before, this is how chapter 8 starts. Brothers and sisters in Corinth, we want to let you know about the grace of God that has been given to the churches of Macedonia. These are small churches in Greece, not Corinth, not powerful Roman colonies. These are tiny places. Listen to what he says. While they were being tested with many problems, their extra amount of happiness and their extreme poverty resulted in a surplus of rich generosity. I'm going to read that sentence again, and you tell me how likely this is to happen. You tell me if this makes any sense to you. They're tested with many problems, but their extra amount of happiness and 
their extreme poverty resulted in a surplus of rich generosity. Does that make sense to anybody here present today? I don't see any hands up. Yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? What's the difference? Joy. They are suffering. They don't have a whole lot, yet they get the vision. The vision inspires them to share of what little they have, and they're filled with this sense of generosity. I assure you that they gave what they could afford and even more than what they could afford, and they did it voluntarily. I didn't sit down with them and hold pen to pledge card. They did this themselves. They urgently begged us for the privilege of sharing in this service for the saints. They urged us, they begged us. This word privilege is vital to Paul's argument. I'm going to come back to it. They exceeded our expectations because they gave themselves to the Lord first and to us consistent with God's will. As a result, we challenged Titus, one of Paul's mentees, trainees, to finish this work of grace with you the way he had started it. Be the best He's saying to the Corinthians now, be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you are the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love we've inspired in you. I'm not giving you an order, but by, sorry, But by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes so that you might become rich through his poverty. Now, all through chapters 8 and 9, of 2 Corinthians, Paul uses this word in Greek, charis. Can y'all say that with me? Charis. Charis. C-H-A-R-I-S. The text in me wants to say charis. I think it's charis. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I'm going with charis. It sounds better. Charis literally means Greek, uh, grace, and in most instances, it's translated as grace. But I want to show you how often he uses this word in different ways to articulate what he's trying to do here, to encourage generosity. This word appears in chapter 8, let's see, six times, and in chapter 9, three times. The Macedonians begged us for the privilege of sharing. I said I was going to come back to that word. Why did I come back to it? It's charis. Grace is a privilege. It's an opportunity. They begged us for the charis of sharing. And then in verse 6, we challenged Titus, my trainee, to finish this work of grace, charis, to finish this work of grace. That's the offering. So charis refers to the, the privilege, the opportunity Charis also refers to the actual financial gift, the work of grace. In verse 9, it says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In this sense, theologically, grace is the unmerited favor of God toward humanity, right? We don't earn our salvation. It's given to us as an acharis by the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah? Are you all with me? Y'all didn't know you were going to get a Greek lesson today. And then he goes on to say, but thank God, this is in verse 16, thank God who put the same commitment that I have found in you in Titus' heart. Thank God 
is Chorus again. So Chorus also means thanksgiving. So where have we gone? Privilege, opportunity, the offering itself, theologically the unmerited love of God, and thanksgiving to God. They are all chorus. They're all grace working together. So Paul, over and over again, reminding the people, God has given the power to provide you with more than enough of every kind of chorus. There are more kinds of grace than just one. We, uh, they will pray for you, the, the, the Jerusalem Christians, they will pray for you and they will care deeply for you because of the outstanding grace, chorus, that God has given to you. Thank God, chorus, thanksgiving, for this gift that words can't describe. So, so when, when we receive an offering, we're not receiving an offering to pay bills. We're not receiving an offering to pay my salary or Pastor Rosedane's salary. We're receiving an offering as grace. It's a gift. The very opportunity to participate in an offering is grace. It's a gift. It's a privilege. And yet so often because we're so uncomfortable thinking about money, talking about money, what happens is our giving becomes constrained. This thing, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. This thing is just, it's been a morning. Uh, when we change our mindset, though, and we allow generosity to take over, then our lives are changed. So next Sunday, we'll talk more about kind of the pitfalls of giving, where Jesus says, be aware of all kinds of greed. There's more than one kind, right? That'll be next week. But today, we're thinking about uh, what we greater than me. You should support the Jerusalem offering, Corinthians, because they are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They need our support. Uh, so I have a fairly complicated history with giving, my own personal life. We didn't talk about money in my home family at all. Like I knew we had money, but I didn't know. I knew my parents supported the church, but I never knew how or why or how much. It was just like the plate came through. It went right past me because I didn't have anything of being a kid. Mom or dad would throw something in, and it would just go on. We never talked about giving as a spiritual practice. It was never part of growing up. Uh, when I was called to ministry, I started off doing youth ministry, and I was part-time at that. I was making $13,000 to be a part-time youth director. When the offering plate came past me, I just let it pass, right? Because I was already, I, I was making less than what I needed to, I mean, I was fine, but uh, I'll just be confession. All right, I'll just say it. I believe that my life was a tithe. I was serving the church and not being well compensated for it. I was, I was serving a whole lot more. I was working a whole lot more than 20 hours. I wasn't getting paid a whole lot. And so I felt like having no basis to think about this, my life was a tithe. Later, as an intern at Perkins, I was assigned to Oak Lawn United Methodist, which is in Dallas, a little bit uh, north of downtown. And I remember, I remember thinking the same thing. I'm making $18,000. At this point, I'm married. And that's full-time, by the way, $18,000 full-time. I'm still a student at SMU. The plate is just, I'm just passing it along. My life is a tithe. And then something changed in me. I started reading all these books on church leadership. Do you know what rule number one in church leadership is? 
And it doesn't matter if you're a pastor or a lay person. You know what rule number one in church leadership is? The people you are leading will not do anything that you will not do first. Yeah? It's not just a church thing. It's leadership in all categories, right? In every business, in every organization, the people we are leading will not do anything that we do not do. It's worse when we teach something that we are not doing. Now, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't teaching on tithing because I wasn't tithing. But what happens when we don't teach on tithing in the church? People do not become generous. It gives in to all those other things in the society that I talked about, all those negative talks about giving. When we don't teach the spiritual value of giving from the church's perspective, we don't allow people to be transformed by grace. Yeah? Are you with me? Remember, Karis has many different aspects to it. So I had to become a tither before I could teach about tithing. I had to be generous before I could teach about generosity, right? It doesn't work the other way. So over, and it, it, hey, it wasn't overnight. But Christy and I sat down, we made a budget. We, we sat out, we, we made priorities. This is who we want to be. This is what we want our lives to reflect. And over time, we've gotten to that point We've been consistently giving 10% of our income and, and often more than that. And here's the thing about that. We've never missed it. And the, uh, the first thing that changed was just our pattern of giving. We gave to the church first. Not at the end of the month when something was left over. We gave first to the church. Believing that the God who said, I will provide for you, that the Christ who said, look at the lilies of the, of the field and the birds of the air, your father feeds them, how much more are worth of you? We started to believe those things, reflect those things in our giving, and our lives changed. This amazing thing happened. We've, we've got friends here from our last congregation. I'm so glad uh, that they're here. Um, at our last church in Sherman, we had this vision for our church, this whole process we went through, and it produced this vision of a capital campaign. We're going to renovate the church. We're going to do these amazing things. Uh, we need to raise this much money. And so Christy and I started thinking about, okay, this is addition to our tithe, right? What are we going to give? What are we going to give? What should we give? We both had an idea of what we should give. And we settled on that same number and then, and then we said, I don't think it's enough. I think we can do more. And we ended up pledging to give twice what we originally planned on. And over three years, we did that, and we never missed that extra income. I don't know how to explain all that. There's not a, a guaranteed investment policy in the United Methodist Church. But when we step out in faith, when we, when we see the vision, and we become transformed into generous people, then talking about money is no longer uncomfortable. Now we can talk about money as the privilege of giving. Remember, privilege is chorus. The opportunity to give itself is a gift even before what we actually give to the congregation. And then when we give the gift, we trust that it's used for God's purposes in the world. And so we don't give with strange attached to it. We don't give with an expectation that everything we believe will be, will be followed to the note. We believe it's a gift. It's a mentality that is totally different than the consumer culture. Consumer culture says, give me your gift, give me your money, and you will receive this thing. You'll feel better about yourself. You'll look better. People will appreciate you. They'll like you more. 
God doesn't promise anything like that. We don't give to God in order to receive anything, right? Yes, Pastor Frank. Yes, we don't give to God to receive anything. We give because we have already received everything from God. Yeah? Yeah. We give because we've already received everything from God. Everything belongs to God in the first place. And so when we give, we respond. When we have this mindset, then giving becomes no different than praying, than attending worship, uh, than, than serving in the church. It's a spiritual discipline. There's a reason why Jesus talked about giving about, uh, more than any other subject except for the kingdom of God. And it's because our lives, our hearts need to be transformed. When Jesus saw Zacchaeus in the tree, what did he say? I need to come to your house tonight. Why? Because Zacchaeus was rich. But he wasn't rich in blessing. He wasn't rich in grace. And after seeing Jesus, having a meal with Jesus, what did Zacchaeus do? If I've cheated anybody, if I've defrauded anybody, I'll give back multiple times. And what did Jesus say? Salvation has come to this house tonight. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about giving as a spiritual discipline. We will not be saying anything about, y'all need to give next year so that we can pay our bills. That will not be coming from my mouth or from anybody else's mouth uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? We give because we've received and we believe in the church's mission and we want to bless the neighborhood, the world, and everyone around us in the name of Christ, yeah? So join with me in this idea of greater than. We can do more together than we can on our own. We can do these things and greater things because of the curse of God active in our lives. And we give thanks for the one, to the one who has given us and blessed us in every good way, including our resources so that by the sharing of those resources, others come to know the cars of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I invite our ushers to come as we continue our worship with our giving. Let's pray together. Lord, everything we have has come from you as a gift, and we are grateful. Thank you for giving us food to eat and clothes to wear and a church to celebrate and worship in. Thank you for the many blessings that we enjoy. Give us generous hearts that we might share of what we have so that more people may come to know the chorus that is beyond all understanding, your grace given to us in Christ, in whose name we pray and give. Amen.
invite you to remain standing as we sing verses 1 and 4 of our final hymn, uh, number 557, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, verses 1 and 4. We go forth from this place now into the world uh, because we are greater than me. Amen? We go together into the mission field that Christ calls us to serve. We go together to live out lives worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ. We go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.